Cottage. My name is Erin Mast. I'm the executive director here. Um, tonight is our fifth and final Cottage conversation of the season, supported by David Bruce Smith, um, Mr. James Tennis, and Mr. Mr. Matthew Tennis support this program. Please stay tuned for more information about next season, kicking off in September with Candace Hooper's book. Um, <laughs> if I can, we have the date already set too. So yeah, um, she will be here with us kicking off in September. At the conclusion of tonight's Q&A, we invite you to um, the book signing in the Lincoln Library downstairs. In addition, I want to invite you all to join us at the American Immigration Council um, next Thursday, May 26th, for an encore performance of Sadade, a shadow puppet performance by Wits and Puppets. Sadade illuminates the immigrant experience in Washington, D.C., and it builds on our current exhibit on Lincoln and Immigration, which I hope many of you had a chance to see in our visitor center this evening before the program. Please also um, silence your phones at this time. Joining us tonight is Sidney Blumenthal and Jonathan Carl to discuss Mr. Blumenthal's book, Self-Made Man, The Political Life of Abraham Lincoln, the first volume in his trilogy on the 16th president. Sidney Blumenthal is former assistant and senior advisor to President Bill Clinton, senior advisor to Hillary Clinton, and advisor to the Clinton Foundation. Author of nine books, including The Clinton Wars, The Rise of the Encounter Establishment, and The Permanent Campaign, he has also been a writer and editor of publications like The Washington Post, New Republic, Vanity Fair, and The New Yorker, specializing in foreign affairs and national politics. Besides his literary career, he also is the executive producer of the Academy Award-winning documentary, Taxi to the Dark Side, which also won him an Emmy Award. He was a senior fellow at the New York University Center for Law and Security from 2005 to 2012, and has been a member of the Council on Foreign Relations for 27 years. And if it, it was just last year um, at the cottage that he appeared here in the other chair uh, with author Don Doyle to discuss Lincoln's foreign policy. Jonathan Carl was named ABC News Chief White House Correspondent in December 2012. He regularly contributes to all broadcasts, including Good Morning America, World News Tonight with Dave Muir, and Nightline. His reporting drives news cycles and has been recognized with some of the most prestigious honors in journalism, including the 2013 Walter Cronkite Award for National Individual Achievement in Election Cycle Reporting, as well as an Emmy Award for his coverage of the 2009 inauguration of President Barack Obama. Before joining ABC News, he worked for CNN and the New York Post, and his work has been published in Wall Street Journal, The Weekly Standard, The New Republic, Reason, The Christian Science Monitor, and the San Francisco Chronicle. Throughout the experience here at President Lincoln's Cottage, we illuminate Lincoln's belief in the right to rise and his personal experience rising up the ladder of society. In A Self-Made Man, The Political Life of Abraham Lincoln, Volume 1, 1809 to 1849, Mr. Blumenthal astutely shows how Lincoln emerged from humble origins to become a rising politician in his early career. As friend of the cottage, Harold Holzer wrote, Quote, Sidney Blumenthal has accomplished the unimaginable. He has crafted an extraordinarily fresh account of the rise of Abraham Lincoln, master politician. I don't think there is a better, more eminently readable account of Lincoln's political rise in the entire literature. Please join me in welcoming Sidney Blumenthal and Dr. Thank you. It's awesome to be here at the Lincoln Cottage, a, a really special place and a, and a first first time visit for me. So thank you. And uh, Cindy, I've got to I've got to say this is a wonderful book. This is a really this is a really great read, and this only brings us up to the end of his uh, term in Congress to uh, to 1849. So I want to ask you you come at this with a with with a clear point of view. Um, it's uh, you, you are portraying Abraham Lincoln as the political figure. Politician, uh, as opposed to the, you know, the, uh, the the great emancipator who didn't really want to get his, you know, hands dirty with grubby politics. You say that is a myth. That this was somebody who was a lifelong politician and somebody who loved, relished even the dark arts. Well, first I want to say that it's an honor to be here again in the Lincoln Cottage, and I'm delighted to be here, and I'm, and I'm also delighted to be here with. With, with John, um, with whom I had worked in the past uh, when we were both at the New Republic. John began his journalistic career as a reporter at the New Republic when I was there, and there have been uh, a number of uh, 
uh, prominent uh, people who have emerged from the New Republic. Uh, the current Deputy Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, a uh, great historian now, uh, David Greenberg of Rutgers, American historian. And I think of John as the most distinguished journalist who have emerged from our magazine. Well, well uh, Sidney was our mentor. He was somebody who would give us reading assignments. We would go out after that. Uh, and we'd, 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 we'd discuss them over drinks. I mean, it was, it was just... Uh, that is great. We, we did. We had, we, had a great, we had a great time. Uh, Lincoln, the politician. Um, after Lincoln's uh, assassination, he was transfigured. And people thought of him as a martyr. And subsequent generations depicted him, portrayed him. There was a, created him as a Lincoln portrait above politics, even above his own humanity. Uh, if you look at, if all of us have been to the Lincoln Memorial, that uh, imposing white alabaster marble monument with Lincoln above us, and we're all looking up. But actually, Lincoln was a man who literally walked in those spots and was a practicing politician who was learning his craft. And by learning those skills, he became the great emancipator. He didn't, the, the great politician, the political genius, and the great emancipator were not two people. And they were not two separate aspects of somebody. They were one and the same. And he was able to vindicate his principles because he was able to practice politics and learn through a lifetime, beginning running for office from the age of 23 on, of every part of politics and every gritty aspect of it. And, and you write uh, that he was known in those early years as, as the slasher, and, and I want to read this. Uh, this is not what we think about. We think about honest day, right? Uh, you, you say he was deploying the techniques of sarcasm, belittlement, and ridicule uh, to go after his political foes. I mean, he he get he get into it. Well, he, Lincoln uh, arrives. Uh, uh, he's elected to the state legislature. He's lost one election. He's learned how to do this, and he wins. And he and he he shows up and uh, to the capital of Vandalia, not Springfield, and it's a pretty rough and tumble town. Uh, and uh, he's taken over by uh, he becomes he's sort of seized upon because he's a very talented raw guy. He's seized upon by the leading Whig leader, uh, John Stewart, and uh, he uh, he Stewart says he teaches him log rolling, which is uh, trading off favors and how to maneuver in the legislature. And Lincoln is, uh, has actually been training himself in country debating societies, in back rooms of country stores uh, late at night, uh, in small, in New Salem and elsewhere. And he comes now and he, he, is, he has an amazing skill as a young man. He's able to stand on a platform and tear his opponents apart. <laughs> And he gains a, a reputation as a slasher. I mean, he learned, and he humiliates particularly older, more established men on the platform. There's one incident that's described where he makes a point of brushing up against his opponent, and his coat opens up, revealing a ruffled shirt, and his his uh, his. His watch pops out, and it's a very expensive watch. And he's an aristocrat; he's not of the people. Um, Lincoln learns all these skills in the beginning of learning his debating skills, how to use logic, how to make an argument, but also how to do politics. And he learns that um, sometimes this is not always the best way to uh, to get ahead and achieve his goals. But he learns it by doing it. Hey, and you, uh, just to fast forward many, many, many years, you, you talked about the speech you gave at the Willard Hotel to the uh, soldiers from Indiana, where you, right? I mean, I just read, he says, whenever I hear anyone arguing for slavery, I feel a strong impulse to see it tried on him personally. <laughs> <laughs> there, there was a little malice for some. Um, <laughs> well, um, but that's, that's a side of him. Link, link, uh, th there's several things to say about that incident. Um, Lincoln um, 
liked to use that, and he said that more than once in different ways. Um, and um, he was, well, he would say, well, this, uh, in other places, well, you know, I understand Southerners, uh, they're caught in their circumstances, I appreciate, you know, how they can't get out of, you know, being slave owners, and uh, we would all have to deal with this, too. He was trying to be understanding in order to move them. He also, that was how he really felt. And he also thought about this in an unusual way, which goes to the heart of his real identity, which is he was unusual, even though he was never a radical abolitionist, he was always anti-slavery, in thinking and talking about slavery from the vantage point of the slave. Most of the abolitionists spoke from the vantage point of the pulpit, and they would try and arouse outrage about the treatment of slaves. But Lincoln often would describe what it was like to be a slave. And I begin this book with a chapter called The Slave, and the slave is Lincoln. He said in 1856, when he assumed his new identity as a Republican, I used to be a slave. He was very reticent about talking about his own personal past because it was a past of poverty and humiliation. And he was, he thought of himself as a slave to his father, who rented him out as an indentured servant until he was 21 and took his wages. His father himself was an oppressed person, an illiterate farmer who had fled slavery in Kentucky because he was forced to compete for wages with slaves, and went across the Ohio River into Indiana, and was anti-slavery himself. Uh, attended anti what were called emancipationist churches, small primitive Baptist churches. So, for for Lincoln, that sentiment is very deeply rooted. And I want to say one more thing about that incident, which is, it's near the end of the war, and it involves um, this house. That quote, because um, uh, John Wilkes Booth and his men had staged their attempted kidnapping of Lincoln, um, as they thought he was going to be going back and forth from the soldier's home on that day. And they were foiled because Lincoln was not where they thought he was. Instead, Lincoln was at Willard's Hotel. And Booth, not very well known, then, after having missed the kidnapping, goes to the hotel and is in the crowd, here's that. and hears this, and it, enra and it enrages him. So I want to get to your, what, one of the aspects of this book that is truly wonderful is your description of the Washington, D.C. that Abraham Lincoln comes to the first time around. He comes as a, as a member of Congress. And there's a lot about this, but I want to start with just, just one, because I, I, he has dinner with Henry Clay. Yes. And to tell, tell us about that dinner, his impressions of, uh, of, of the great Henry Clay. Well, Henry Clay is um, one of the greatest Americans of his day, or any day. He was <coughs> Henry Clay, um, in, uh, this book is called The Self-Made Man. Lincoln used that phrase, and he took it, borrowed it from Henry Clay, who invented that term to apply to himself, <coughs> and create that kind of politics of having been somebody who had risen from a, uh, a poverty to become a prominent politician. Henry Clay was, as Lincoln said, his beau ideal. He was his model. He looked up to him. He was the leader of, he, Henry Clay created the Whig Party, and Lincoln made himself into a Whig. Um, Lincoln also married Mary Todd, as we know. Mary Todd's father was Henry Clay's business partner an ally in Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, Mary Todd, as a girl, knew Henry Clay and was part of that political circle. She was known as a violent little Whig. And at one dinner with Henry Clay as a girl, she said, I want to marry the President of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> and, and she said, and Mr. Clay, you will be President. And it, he burst out in the laughter and said, I think you're a little too young for me. <laughs> <laughs> but, Lincoln um, had not met his hero, 
By the time he meets his hero, Lincoln had also betrayed his hero. Yeah. He had um, not supported, Lincoln had become an, uh, an, the important Whig leader in the state of Illinois. He was known as the, uh, uh, the Sangamon chieftain and head of the Springfield Junta. Uh, he was really the, the leader of the Whig party in the state. And uh, he did not support uh, Clay in certain elections because he thought he would lose uh, for president. Clay was always running for president. Right, right. And uh, Lincoln wanted a win. Lincoln he wanted back a winner. He, want, he wanted a winner, and and he wanted a winner for very real reasons. He wanted his party to win. He wanted the patronage jobs to come to the Whig Party in Illinois, and he wanted to play a role in distributing them and be powerful and influential and achieve his goals. And uh, and so he, he already betrayed him, but here he is. He's still here he is. Now he gets to see Henry Clay. Henry Clay is now defeated for the presidency. He's lost in 1844. He still wants to run in 1848. Uh, uh, oh, and um, he's an old man. He's a defeated old man. He's a sad old man. His son, his namesake, has been killed in the Mexican War. And Clay had opposed the Mexican War. And he's about to give a speech in Lexington on a platform introduced by Robert Todd, Mary Todd's father, um, and to talk about his feelings about the Mexican War, the way forward in what should happen with the, all the territory that's been gained by it, which then becomes the basis of the issue that will create the Civil War and draw the new war. And Lincoln has never met his hero. And he's about to meet him, and he's got his father-in-law there, his wife, they all know Henry Clay. And he is deeply disappointed. And why? Henry Clay doesn't, is not warm, he's cold, he's condescending, he keeps his distance from this younger man, from the, <coughs> from the provinces. Another self-made man, but he doesn't really recognize him as how we think of Abraham Lincoln. He's just another politician going to the Congress, another guy. He doesn't realize he's talking to Abraham Lincoln. No. <laughs> he thinks that this person about to begin his term, first term in Congress, which was his only term, is talking to Henry Clay. Right, 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 exactly, exactly. And so, uh, however, he gives. Uh, Lincoln a book that describes him to him of his, his collected speeches. And uh, Lincoln retains that. And then Lincoln goes off to his one term in Congress to Washington. By the way, so Lincoln was self lit term. He, he that pledge he was only going to run once, right? Did he make that pledge public in his campaign or not? Why? why? What, what was the reason for that? Lincoln got caught up in all kinds of um, politics. Yeah. And um, he was, uh, he thought that, and he was not um, overwhelmingly popular in his district. Um, the Springfield Sangamon County District was the only Whig district in Illinois. It was a heavily democratic state. Uh, Illinois was also the most racist state in the North, had a draconian black code. So Lincoln um, helped institute what was called the convention system. We saw the convention, we saw the controversies about the convention. Yes, I've heard. Uh, and it was a way to enforce party discipline and create party slates of candidates. And Lincoln manipulated this. And um, he had a rival. And his rival was a handsome man uh, from a, a wealthier background. Um, and who was a prominent politician named John J. Harvey. And he also happened to be the cousin of his wife. <laughs> and um, he encouraged uh, uh, Hardin to run for governor. Hardin didn't want to run for governor. And then Lincoln screwed him <laughs> and denied him the nomination for uh, Congress uh, and instead gave it to his good friend, Ed Edward Dickinson Baker on the basis that there'd be a rotation and he would succeed him. And that was the deal. And Hardin was bitter about it and felt that Lincoln had manipulated this rigged system, the convention system. And he goes off and joins the 
army and becomes a prominent officer and is killed in the Mexican War. He would have, had he lived, probably been one of the great politicians in the way of Lincoln uh, in Illinois. And instead, somebody who might have been a, you know, a competitor and a rival is eliminated by fate. So here's Lincoln, and he, he gets to Congress. He is there for one term. He opposes the Mexican War. Uh, he, he believes that the war has been falsely started by the president and that he is manipulated. It could never happen. <laughs> <laughs> the intelligence of the information yeah, yeah. about it. <laughs> And so he introduces what's called the spot resolution, demanding to know the spot where the first... The Mexican spot, aggression happened. Yeah, where, where the first American blood was shed by the Mexicans because he believes that was a false story pro uh, promulgated by the president to start the war. And, and in fact, it almost certainly was. It was good, and Lincoln was correct. However, it didn't, uh, the war was wildly popular, and uh, uh, Herndon, William Henry Herndon, Lincoln's law partner, is, who is also his all-purpose political aide, is frantic that Lincoln is making himself unpopular in the district. Which he was. Which he was because of his anti-war sentiment. And Lincoln is trashed by his perennial rival, Stephen A. Douglas, uh, who's a senator, who calls him Ranchero Spotty. <laughs> <laughs> and what does it mean? Well, a ranchero was a, was a term for a Mexican guerrilla during the war. So basically, he's, and Spotty refers to the spot resolution. He's ridiculing. Basically, he's calling him a terrorist. And uh, so Lincoln probably wanted to run for another term, but he had promised one term, and he, and had, he wasn't going to win if he ran. And he adhered to it, and the person who then ran as the Democrat was a Mexican war hero who won in the Whig district. So it was, it was not a good year. It was not a good Whig year. But, but he, he comes to Washington, and he ends up staying at Mrs. Sprigg's boarding house, which is where, it's, it's where the Library of Congress is now, is that? Yeah. Mrs. Spriggs boarding house um, is, a, is, is the fourth house in a row of a row of townhouses on the site of what is now the Library of Congress. Everyone knows the Library of Congress. Facing the Capitol. That's where Lincoln lived. So I want to just imagine it. The, he's facing the Capitol. In front of the Capitol is a large statue of classical statue of George Washington. That very statue is now in the Smithsonian. You can see it in the Smithsonian. The dome is not the dome that you see now. There's no statue on top. Um, it's a dome that is rotting, and, the, and they have to completely dismantle it. it it's not, the repair is not completed until the end of the Civil War. And two, if you, you're facing the Capitol, I'm just, I'm just giving you a physical picture. You walk to the end of that row, down to Maryland Avenue, where the, where the Supreme Court is today. And you walk to that street, you know, between the Supreme Court and the Folgers Theater. That wasn't a street, it was a slave pen. And they kept slaves there and sold them. And they would take them in chains, literally march them past the Capitol. And they would take them to the Navy Yard, down, down 8th, and they would put them on boats and they'd ship them to the south, where they were sold. Lincoln witnessed all of this. Um, Mrs. Spriggs, who is Mrs. Spriggs? <laughs> Mrs. Spriggs is a Virginia widow who is making <coughs> her living running a boarding house. Everyone, almost everyone who came to the Congress lived in a boarding house. And which boarding house you lived in mattered politically. Uh, usually lived with people who you agreed with and were sort of known by that from the earliest days of the Republic. Uh, very few people lived in houses. And Mrs. Sprigg, Sprigg's house was known as Abolition House. Um, John Quincy Adams, when he'd been a congressman and fought the gag rule uh, uh, about it, which prohibited uh, petitions against slavery from being accepted by the Congress, had an aide 
It was the first congressional aide. His name was Theodore Weld. <laughs> and he was he was the, the ancestor of Bill Weld. Of Bill Weld. And he was a leading abolitionist and did a lot of the work for and devised a lot of the tactics for John Quincy Adams. Lincoln comes, he he's in the back row, seat 191 in the in the old House of Representatives, which is today's statuary hall. And in the front row is the former president of the United States, John Quincy Adams, who arises to protest something. He has a stroke, dies. Lincoln witnesses the death of John Quincy Adams. So Lincoln is in the abolition house. If they, if they, if there's no record of them meeting or... There's no record of Quincy Adams acknowledging him. Or of saying that he's there with John Quincy Adams. Well, but here's... There's direct, there, there are very direct connections here, if we want to go into the Quincy Adams business. Quincy Adams, and I write about this in the book, I have a whole chapter on Quincy Adams, he's so important. Um, Quincy Adams develops the whole idea of how emancipation can be constitutional. Because uh, slavery was a local institution that was protected within the states. Uh, so how could, how could, that be overridden. And Quincy Adams said, through military means, in a war, then the president would have war powers for emancipation. And he wrote this, he says this in a speech against John C. Calhoun, the Tribune of the Master Class. Uh, and uh, Lincoln becomes president. And um, Charles Sumner, the senator from Massachusetts, who uh, thinks of himself as uh, the, a, a successor to John Quincy Adams and, and his ideas comes to the White House. And he says, very early on in Lincoln's administration, he says, you know what? There's a way of doing this. It's the war powers of the president. And that becomes the kernel of the Emancipation Proclamation. So there's a direct connection between Lincoln being in the same room as Quincy Adams and what and the emancipation in his presidency. So, but Mrs. Sprague's boarding house, known as the Abolition House, was also believed to be a, a station on the Underground Railroad. It was, and there's no way that Lincoln didn't know that, because at one point slave catchers run into the house and grab a waiter and try and sell him back into slavery because he's a, they say he's a fugitive slave. And uh, members of the boarding house, including the powerful Congressman Joshua Giddings, the leading abolitionist in the Congress uh, of Ohio, rushes to the slave pen and says, return him. And he says, he's gone. And, but they track him down. They finally get him released through an act that they give speeches on the floor of the, of the house. Lincoln, this is what Lincoln witnesses. He's, he's experiencing all this directly. Uh, and he's a, he's a member of not only the House, but this House. So, uh, by the way, there's a really <coughs> remarkable photograph that I spent a lot of time looking at, uh, the view you describe uh, from, from the vantage point of, uh, of, of Mrs. Mrs. Spriggs. Mrs. Yeah. Spriggs of the Capitol building. Um, it, is, it is really remarkable. But another scene you describe incredibly vividly, it sounds almost like a, out of a Shakespearean comedy. Uh, you, you have this, uh, the case of the Pearl and the trial that comes after. Can you, can you set this, that this is, this is uh, an effort? Well, you, you, you got here. This is an incredible, here, Lincoln is a congressman. This yeah. is, these are the events. This is what's going on in Washington. This is what's going on in Washington. This is what Lincoln is seeing and experiencing. Um, in the middle of the night, 70-some uh, uh, slaves um, steal away from the houses where they are in Washington. Uh, most of them house servants. One of them uh, uh, working for Dolly Madison, still alive. Um, who, would, who, would, who would sell off her slaves as a way of... Uh kind of uh, maintaining her, her, her way of life, right? Just yeah. like, you know, like a, yeah. Whenever she, it was a little bit of money, she, yeah, instead of selling off a painting, she'd sell off a slave. 
Um, and um, they all gathered in a boat um, at, the, at the dock and uh, called the Pearl in order to escape at night and sail to the north and be free. Um, it was, uh, there was an extensive underground operation in Washington. It reached into Mrs. Sprigg's house. Um, uh, there were operatives in Washington who were part of this, and the boat was caught, and all the slaves were brought back. Many of them were sold into slavery to the Deep South and never were heard from again. Um, some of them were recovered and bought by abolitionists and then taken on tours of the North. Um, and there was a trial of the captain and his, and his first mate, and um, uh, uh, people who were close to Lincoln get involved in this defense of, of, of them. Very prominent, people who become prominent in, um, in his life later. Salmon Chase is involved, uh, becomes his secretary of the treasury. Uh, William Henry Seward is becomes an advisor to the defense. Uh, Horace Mann. And Horace Mann, who is the successor to John Quincy Adams, and who then um, becomes a kind of mentor to Abraham Lincoln. But, but I want to read, in, in the trial, Horace Mann is just remarkable. Um, he, he's making the, uh, he's defending these men that have been charged. He says, and talking of, of, of the slaves, though we may call men slaves, yet are they not human beings? He pointed out, quote, many of the colored people can read. Who knows? But some of them may have read the Declaration of American Independence and in their blindness and simplicity of mind applied its immortal truths to themselves. <laughs> Lincoln often made that point himself. About it. For him, the fundament of, of of everything was the Declaration of Independence. And by the way, the judge uh, at, hammered his gavel angrily, such inflammatory language cannot be allowed in this court. <laughs> the Declaration of Independence. <laughs> That's right. Well, what happens later, uh, and Lincoln watches the debates as they evolve uh, when he leaves Congress in the 1850s, is that people did not from the South wind up on the floor of the Senate and the House denouncing the Declaration of Independence and calling it a lie. And for Lincoln, this is the greatest lie itself. It's the greatest outrage. Horace Mann is a very interesting figure. He's the creation of the common school system, uh, uh, public schools as we know it in the United States. And he was uh, quite a politician in Massachusetts as well. And Lincoln, um, at the end of all these events, the, the fugitive slaves grabbed, uh, the Pearl incident, this public trial, uh, Lincoln opposing the war, being denounced, he's ranchero, a spotty. Uh, there are many bills to oppose the extension of slavery and the territory that's been gained in the Mexican War. And, uh, a bill is, a proposal is advanced it's called the Wilmot Proviso. Lincoln says, I'm a proviso man. And, that, would pro and that, that proviso stipulates that none of the territory can be slave territory, that it all has to be free. It never is enacted, the Wilmot Proviso, but it becomes really, evolves into the basis of anti-slavery policy. And Lincoln's thinking about opposing the extension of slavery. But here's, here's what happens. The various bills that get proposed, including for emancipation in the District of Columbia. And they all fail. Some of them are too radical. Uh, they're just not going to work. So Lincoln tries to figure out a consensus bill that he can do. And um, he's advised by Horace Mann. He's advised by Joshua Giddings. Um, how do you create this bill? And he, it's his first bill. Um, that he advances as a congressman in a federal role, national role, for emancipation, it's for gradual compensated emancipation in the District of Columbia. And by the way, uh, when uh, emancipation did happen in the district, we have Emancipation Day here, mm -hmm. it was compensated. Um, and 
uh, the slave owners in this district were compensated for their slaves. So, but the bill is not even able to be proposed on the floor of the House. It's an abortive bill. But what's also interesting is that Giddings, who's a very influential anti-slavery leader and a kind of radical and involved third-party movements like yeah. the Free Soil Movement, is very devoted as a result. He lives in, lives in Mrs. Briggs' boarding house. He lives in Abolition House. It, he's very devoted to Lincoln. He thinks Lincoln is a straight shooter and a uh, the politician that he will support, even though other radical abolitionists attack him. For compensating for this being a, a, a half for, a measure for... Well, for, for, for all of his compromises, yes. supposedly, with the issue of slavery. Um, Lincoln is too much the politician for them, but Giddings understands. It's, it's it's he has no link. He has no link. It's interesting that the very first bill, which I hadn't realized that he votes on as a member of Congress, is to abolish the slave trade in D.C. Hmm. Um, so, uh, a couple more, then I want to get to some questions, but you, you, your portrait of Mary Todd is vivid in, in this book as well, and she clearly comes across as the more ambitious and the more, the more politically ambitious uh, for, for, for her husband, setting the, the, the sights high. So you have, you have this, this couple where the spouse is the one um, who, who really, in many ways, seems more politically ambitious. Is there any parallel to anybody in the current? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know myself, <laughs> but Mary, Mary Todd is um, some, somebody who was from uh, the southern upper class who came to uh, Springfield, uh, brought by her sister. Uh, who was married to Ninian W. Edwards, who was the son of the former territorial governor of Illinois. And they lived in a mansion on Aristocracy Hill, and one by one, the sisters came to find eligible husbands. Mm -hmm. And Mary Todd found someone who her sister Elizabeth thought was unacceptable, <laughs> uh, who was plebeian. There's a complicated story in here about the romance. They break up, Lincoln has a nervous breakdown, they come together, Lincoln almost fights a duel, trying to hide her part in dirty tricks that he is playing with her um, against uh, uh, one of Stephen A. Douglas's allies. Um, so the romance is all bound up with politics. She is very political. She's the most political woman he's ever met. She speaks her uh, views in company, which women were not supposed to do about politics. and. Uh, whenever he faltered, she would step up. We think of Lincoln as completely ambitious, and he was. His law partner Herndon said his ambition was like a little engine that you know stop, but it did. And, and where it stopped was that Lincoln liked a certain political positions and thought and was comfortable with them. And it had to do with his, his sense of inferiority, social inferiority where he came from. And Mary Todd would have none of it. She believed him superior to everybody. And she would always push her husband forward. And um, so, for example, it's uh, 1855, and he has run for the state legislature again. He's won a seat. He thinks he can He'll be the Whig floor leader again, he'll manage things. It's a very powerful position. She says, no, you are selling yourself short and I won't have it. She wanted you, to marry a president, remember? She, <laughs> says, she says, you have to run for the Senate and you're, even though you're elected, you're, gonna, you're going to quit before you take that office and you're going to run for the Senate. And uh, his, uh, his political friends describe a scene where he's completely upset, but he does what his wife says and he loses. And um, in his loss, he makes a lot of allies and builds coalitions, complicated story in 1855, when the Whig Party is falling apart, where he supports an anti-slavery Democrat against a pro-slavery Democrat for governor. 
and that becomes one of the bases for creating the Illinois Republican Party. Uh, he doesn't know it though, <laughs> but he owes it to he owes it to Mary. Wow. Okay, so how did you? First of all, this this is volume one of four volumes. It is. <laughs> you got a lot of work to do. Um, when, when, when did this uh, when did this project start, and and you know why why Lincoln, why history? How did you how did you get involved? In this? Well, um, I grew up in Chicago, um, and was taken as a boy by my grandmother's first cousin to Springfield when I was young, and it was really the beginning of my interest in history and American politics. Um, and I saw the sites where Lincoln lived, and Lincoln appeared alive to me, and the past did not appear so distant. And I've always had an interest in Lincoln. Um, I, when I worked in the White House, I <coughs> put up a Lincoln portrait in my office. Um, always hoped it would serve as a guide, <coughs> and sometimes a reproach. Uh, and um, when I finally got enough time and space, I fell down a rabbit hole. And the rabbit hole was Lincoln. I was trying to figure out um, the current uh, politics of race and presidents. I worked with President Clinton and I was involved in the race initiative. And there was a lot going on involving this. And I wanted to I'd go back to President Roosevelt and so on. And I fell back to Lincoln, and I stayed there, and I found Lincoln to be excellent company. And I started this uh, in earnest about 2008, so I've been doing this for about eight years. Uh, I've written now, uh, I've written four volumes. Um, the other volumes are written? Mostly. Uh, volume two is done. Uh, it'll be out next year this time. Volume three will be out the following year this time. Um, it, I've written a draft, I'm still writing that one. Uh, volume 4 is I've written, and it goes all the way through his triumph in the Civil War, the assassination, and Reconstruction, and what happens to his legacy. How, how far in Reconstruction do you go? I go through the election of 1876, mm -hmm. through the day of, of the betrayal of, of the Lincoln legacy mm -hmm. in Reconstruction, mm -hmm. uh, and how that worked out. And, um, uh, so, I mean, but you, you, you're, you've got a, such a fascinating career because you've, you yourself have been a, a practitioner of, of the dark arts of, of politics, and you've been an intellectual and a writer of history and everything else. What, are you, are you, what happens? Do you dive into this, uh, you're wrapping up these next three volumes over the next, uh, I don't know, six months or so? Or are you, um... <laughs> <laughs> Right now, we got to... <laughs> well, my, my... Do you feel drawn by that siren song of politics a little bit? <laughs> well, well the, only, the only plan I have is to, is to talk about each volume every year. <laughs> uh, Abraham Lincoln is in my future. So that's, that's my, my plan for, uh, for that. Yeah. All right, well, let's, uh, let's take some questions. Yes. Uh, did you come across any what you would consider to be unique source material that gives you this, which sounds like a completely different perspective on Lincoln? I, I um, feel that um, the invention of the internet has transformed scholarship. And um, even as I've been writing this, um, it's been changed because uh, all journals are available and um, uh, Google created Google Books and copied whole university libraries and the whole 19th century and early 20th century is online mm -hmm. um, and, and I've been able to find incredible things. I, um, at the same time, I've also been in the National Archives Library of Congress. I'm fortunate to live in Washington go down there. And I have found new material. Um, in this book, uh, I was speaking to uh, to someone here uh, earlier before uh, this event about uh, Lincoln's religion and the influence of his uh, anti-slavery feeling. Uh, and I was able to uh, find 
um, early mention of his parents' involvement in small primitive Baptist emancipationist churches in Kentucky seemed very odd to me. Uh, and I find that in some references, but not many, um, uh, in some previous biographers. And what I did was discover the names of the, of the pastors. And I was able to, through the internet, find very obscure church histories that you could, uh, couldn't find about them uh, and drill down and find out who they were. And then I was able to discover that they were related. And these are all people connected by kinship who are anti-slavery in Kentucky uh, in the early part of the 19th century. And they drift over Indiana into Indiana and they are, an, are they're against slavery. They're an, called emancipationists. Uh, and there, there is an abolitionist movement, and it's it's loose. It's a kind of loose thing. It's not so di doctrinal about solutions, but it's in, and Lincoln's family is part of that. They're illiterate, but they go to these churches. And when Lincoln's uh, mother dies, um, he brings a pastor six months later to to perform a religious ceremony. because Lincoln can write, and his father can't. And he writes and gets the pastor to come uh, over her grave. Uh, and he's one of these emancipationist preachers, these backwoods preachers. So that's one of the things I've been able to discover. Let me just say other things I've been able to discover is our, um, Lincoln, in his speeches, quotes very obscure references. And there'll be quotations from places. Most people have tracked them down, and a lot of uh, younger scholars are now tracking them down, but I've been able to find some of them. So, for example, in the next volume, I've gone through his eulogy of Henry Clay and discovered a, a whole interesting story that gives you an uh, insight into Lincoln's mind in which he quotes, without saying who it is, somebody who he attacks in the eulogy. It turns out to be a pro-slavery Southern theologian, and it's an early, uh, an early uh, expression of his hostility to that theology, which uh, has its uh, final uh, expression in the Second Inaugural. I think it was Barbara talking with you to talk about the seduction of research. Uh, how do you, with, with, with a subject like Lincoln, you could spend, you could have spent the last eight years doing nothing but research, not doing no more. I mean, well, I, I kept writing as I did uh, research, and I, I, I write as, as I work, but um, I'm still working, and I um, don't like to give it up, mm -hmm. and it's, um, it is an addiction, and it is too pleasurable, and I do enjoy the company of Abraham Lincoln. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, my name is John Ellis. I'm with the Lincoln Group of DC. Yes, hi, John. Yeah, How we're are you? planning a uh, trip to uh, Illinois Lincoln sites, and I'm wondering, what do you think now, after having traveled as a child? Do you think going back to uh, Illinois and seeing uh, where Lincoln uh, lived and uh, uh, practice law. You think that's still worthwhile? I think every, I think every American should do it, <laughs> and I'm glad you're doing it. And uh, uh, it's it's uh, it's the house is there, Lincoln's house where he lived with uh, Mary and their boys. Uh, it's preserved. Uh, I saw it. The the village of New Salem is reconstructed. Uh, the law office is reconstructed. Uh, the old state capitol is there where Lincoln prowled his corridors as a Whig politician. Um, so you get a very it's you get a sense of of, of living Lincoln and his tomb is there of course. And before I was there, there was no Lincoln Museum, so I haven't seen that. Oh, <laughs> do you go back and visit? These places when you're when you're to do. You... I haven't been back since I've uh, been born. Wow. 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 You know this whole notion of uh, of a self-made man and autodidacticism in terms of someone like Lincoln. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm of the belief that it has to be spot somewhere. 
someone had to start him on the road to reading. Uh, his interest in Shakespeare from there. It didn't simply just uh, you know, pop up full blow. Exactly, what do you know about that? Well, um, first of all, um, Lincoln had almost no formal education. He had several weeks in what was called a blab school, where they would make you memorize and recite things, but only several weeks. Um, his father disapproved of his reading and would punish him, even physically, for reading. He considered education a form of laziness, and, um, a waste of time, and you know, it was distracting him from getting on with life. He needed to learn how to be a laborer. Uh, and Lincoln, that was part of what Lincoln thought of as his oppression. He was, he considered himself saved by his stepmother, who protected him from his father and encouraged his reading. The stepmother came in and, and thought this was a, a positive thing for him to read. When Lincoln was a, a young boy, he, he wandered around like large counties of Indiana and um, on his own would find older men who had libraries. And he would befriend them, and he was a bright young person, and almost all of them were lawyers. Uh, uh, it's where he first read uh, law books. He would read law books. It's where he discovered the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, where he read his first history in the United States. Um, or in these libraries of local lawyers. Um, he even wrote an article and submitted it to, and one, one of them got it published in a local newspaper about the Constitution. Uh, so a lot of them talked about Shakespeare, too. Shakespeare was very common uh, among uh, those kinds of people, and I'm sure that's where he encountered it. Lincoln became an amateur Shakespearean, and when he was in Illinois, he used to spend a, he would find other amateur Shakespeareans and go off and talk with them. He loved the theater, and um, he was he was stage struck from the first time he ever went to a theory. Uh, the, the first time I believe he was more like a, a little traveling circus, you know, these itinerant characters who would run, wander around town to town and a lady would ride on bareback and there'd be magic tricks and someone would pull something out of a hat and he was... Without well, resorting to the cycle of history, would you call some of these lawyers a uh, homie met uh, as he would uh, surrogate fathers? I think he was looking for surrogate fathers and he would find people later in uh, Illinois. Uh, uh, he found uh, who I don't know if they were, one of them was a surrogate father. It was a man named Bowling Green, who was a prominent uh, Whig politician. And uh, Lincoln more or less would live there and, um, and learn from Bowling Green. But he would find, he would all, Lincoln was the kind of person who would find mentors who could help him learn and advance himself. And um, some of them, understood that uh, he was uh, very unfinished, but uh, somebody they might want who could be useful as a protege, especially politically, when he, when he arrived in Springfield. And he became, and they pulled him up the political ladder. We hear about Lincoln being um, beatified, more or less, and I'm wondering in your uh, readings, have you ever encountered a, uh, I don't seem to hear anything or read anything in which about things he did in which he really is mean-spirited and selfish the way we would think of selfishness. He may betray people, but he has maybe a, a purpose or he may be sarcasm because you know, he's, he's countering uh, somebody's argument in court or uh, it's, a, it's a slave owner something like that. Can you think of a, an incident where... <laughs> Give us some dirt. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, um, I think, uh, you know, the the character who says, you know, with malice toward non maturity for all, has to develop into that. And, um, you know, he begins, at least politically, as 
the slasher. And he's pretty, he, this is rough and tumble politics, and he's, he's pretty mean on the political stage to his opponents. Um, uh, his sense of, about mean-spiritedness was very much related to his notion of religion. And it had to do with his alienation from religion. His alienation from the harsh Calvinism that he saw practice on the frontier, particularly from these hellfire uh, preachers who would enforce their authority and were very cruel, often to young women, who, and considered them sinful uh, for any lapse in their behavior, and uh, sometimes uh, uh, punish them in their community and you know, a, a kind of scarlet letter kind of situation. Lincoln hated that as a boy and revolted against it, even though he had a very deep sense of, of Calvinism in, sen in terms of believing in faith. Um, but he revolted against this and became a free thinker, very consciously. Uh, he And he read deeply in and what were considered to be uh, very radical literature, such as Tom Paine's Age of Reasoning, mm -hmm. urged people to read it, it was an anti-formal <coughs> anti religion. Lincoln himself never, never joined a church, that's all I. Um, and uh, at one point, when he was a young man, he wrote a uh, document disputing the divinity of Christ that uh, was grabbed from his hands by a friend and put into a hot stove and burned <laughs> because he said this would destroy his political viability. Uh, and in his first congressional race, the issue was, in fact, what was called his infidelity. He was an infidel, religiously. He, he ran against an opponent who was a preacher, Peter Cartwright, a Democrat. And, uh, claimed Lincoln didn't believe in religion. Lincoln had to issue a statement saying, I would never support anyone who did not respect religion. <laughs> that was a very lawyerly statement. <laughs> but this relates to Lincoln's idea of mean-spiritedness. Um, and it's pretty deeply rooted in his, in what he saw growing up. And it's part of his revolt against his own background. But, yeah, we have time for one more. Um, I'm curious, just from your perspective as, as having worked with the president, which uh, many of us have not. Um, <laughs> there, there'll Lincoln, be an opportunity. <laughs> um, Lincoln is quoted by almost every president since Lincoln in some form or fashion. And you mentioned that you had the picture and it sort of is a comforting to, to go back to Lincoln. My question is, do presidents actually really measure themselves against the poli political acumen of Lincoln and some of his, his writings and decision making, or is it really just politically expedient to quote him every three to six months? <laughs> Does it, it make sense? I don't know. Yeah, well, I, I think that is a huge, to borrow a word, subject. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, uh, you know, all presidents since Lincoln have lived in his shadow, and all of and and some have measured themselves by him directly, particularly some immediately after him who knew him. Uh, Grant, um, towards the end of his term, <coughs> to a friend, I wish I had had Lincoln's political skill. He had been a general; he didn't have that skill, and um, he was overcome with tribulations in his administration. Um, so I think uh, Lincoln is often cited. Um, I think he's uh, often little understood. Uh, and um, his, there are several portraits of him in the White House. Um, and um, his spirit still lives uh, there. Uh, 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 regardless of whether or not any occupant 
uh, truly understands him because uh, his tradition depends on us. All right, Sydney, thank you very much.